This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 65. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Last week on the Guns Magazine podcast, I talked to Roy Huntington about DIY gunsmithing. That episode proved so popular, we wanted to circle back and talk to Roy a bit more. As we were planning today's show, I realized one of the most common, yet messed up, DIY gunsmithing techniques is repairing or adding a whole new finish to firearms. Whether you're talking traditional hot bluing, DIY cold bluing, spray on finishing, or even parkerizing and water dip, Roy's done it all and has some great insights on the right and wrong way to do it. Whether you're thinking about refinishing an entire gun or just want to touch up a few boogered up screw heads, you need to check out all of Roy's hard earned secrets in this episode. Now, on with the show as I talk to Roy Huntington on do-it-yourself gun refinishing. Well, good afternoon, Roy. Good afternoon, sir. Seems like we just talked, what, a week ago, maybe? Hey, wait a minute. That's (laughs) right. It's not too much of a good thing, is it? No, it's not. And that's why I decided today would be part two of DIY gunsmithing. We had a lot of, uh, we had a great chat last week about DIY gunsmithing, and we got uh, several letters this week from uh, listeners that really thought that was kind of cool and fun. So we thought we would hit another topic along the same vein today. So you graciously agreed to take time out of your your busy schedule and talk to us about DIY gunsmithing part two. You know, I I appreciate it. I really do, because it's funny. I had a few readers found me uh, after that last show and, and they reached out to me saying how much they enjoyed sort of hearing regular guys talk about it in regular language. Well, I thought today I was trying to, you know, there's so much we could talk about it. I mean, that literally could be an entire series in and of itself. But one of the things when I was pondering all the stuff I've done over the years and all the mistakes I've made over the years, probably one of the biggest ones and the first place a lot of folks start is DIY finishes. Uh, you know, the first gun finishes were, were bluing or browning, and that's still with us. But now there's all kinds of shake and bake proprietary special polymer witchcraft voodoo finishes and some of them are pretty easy to put on and some of them even work pretty well so i thought we'd talk about that today i think it's a good idea brent and uh, there's a lot of things like sort of touch up bluing and and some of the spray on finishes that actually you know just the average joe can do so uh so i'm game Let's do it. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about the grandpappy of them all, the uh, the bluing finishes. And you know, there's there's uh, two types, and I don't understand it super well. But there's hot bluing that is uh, uses extremely caustic and and pretty dangerous chemicals. And then there's cold bluing, which there's a lot of proprietary formulas. So let's just start at that point um, when somebody is either working on a gun, refinishing a gun, or they need to fix up. Uh, as I say, a boogered up spot or a screw. What is it you use and, and how do you use it? You know, let's let's bust a couple of myths right off the bat here. And the first thing is, is that you're exactly right about uh, hot blue. And what it is, is it's basically a process where a gunsmith will polish uh, metal down to white, they call it, so there's no finish on it. And however you polish the metal, shiny, matte, whatever, will be the look of the finish after it gets blued. And then he has prepared, it's usually two tanks uh, that are heated, and they're, one of them is full of a, like a pre-treatment, there may be an up after treatment, but the actual bluing tank is full of this as very caustic. I mean, it's really will get you a uh, hot chemical. And then once you have the uh, metal clean, then you dip it in this hot bluing tank. It's much more complicated than this sounds. 
uh, and then through some black magic and you uh, dancing to the witches of Eastwick <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, then you pull this out and hopefully you have a really nice bluing job. And there's different kinds of bluing. There's charcoal bluing and there's um, rust bluing and there's all kinds of different processes to basically get that sort of black, sometimes blue, you know, finish. Mm-hmm. But it is a bit of a uh, of a crapshoot. And unless you really know what you're doing, that's just not something the average garage gunsmith should ever do. Yeah. So now we'll cross that off our list. <laughs> and uh, actually, interesting thing, some might, may not realize is that Bob Brownell, who started Brownells, actually started Brownells by offering a bluing solution that he was began to wholesale uh, in a little ad in the American Rifleman magazine. Yep. I would suppose that would have been maybe in the late 40s, uh, early 50s. And that was the very beginning of what is today this huge corporate conglomerate <laughs> called Brownells. Yeah. And so you know, he saw it, he, and he went for it, and that was really cool. Anyway, uh, cold blowing. The one of the, the the companies that that I think a lot of people will be familiar with is it's called Formula Forty Four Forty. Gun blue. Yep. And it used to be every gun store in the world had a little counter display. It was these little plastic bottles, and they usually had some uh, uh, finishing nails in a little container on them. And then you were supposed <laughs> yes. to be able to pick up one of the finishing nails, dip it in the oh, you know, the test jar, and it would turn it blue. And then you would think, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to buy that and reblue my gun. Yeah. Well, except it was never that easy. Yeah. And it's yeah, even cold bluing has a lot of black art. But I think with today's uh, chemical manufacturers, companies like Outers, uh, Brownells has some some branded different kinds of cold bluing, and there's a, there's actually a whole lot of them out there. There's creams and liquids and pastes, <laughs> and yeah, depending on the on exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, you can sort of match the cold bluing solution to what you want to do. For the average guy who just has some muzzle wear, you know, and maybe wants to darken the sights and stuff like that, uh, Outers make something and it looks like a, a, a felt tip pen. Yep. And it's actually a bluing pen. And and it's okay for just, you know, little shiny edges and things that, that like that, but you wouldn't want to, like, re-blue your gun barrel with it. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Ask me. How do I know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, it was. It, yeah, not a sight for sore eyes, indeed. Well, you know, the the big thing right off the bat uh, is cold bluing is not as good as hot bluing. Now, you know, I've also heard people say a really good cold blue job is better than a lousy hot blue job. So, where do you stand on all that? You know, you're you're actually really right about that. Uh, I, I cold blue even entire guns pretty regularly, uh, especially if they're sort of more affordable guns. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, I've got this old twenty two. Could you make it look better for me? Yeah. Uh, but but a, a well applied uh, cold blue using uh, one of the better quality bluing solutions. There's one from Brownells called T4. There's an other one called called Dicopran, and if you if you prepare the metal correctly, if you polish it right, if you clean it good, and then you do multiple coats of bluing, it actually can come out pretty darn good. And and I think we should talk about a few tips like that. If you're game, would you like me to leap into that? That's where I was going next. Is is surface prep? Is that the key to this whole thing? You know, it, it really is. It's it's surface prep and application. It's not like a spray can where you just spray it the color on and with cold blowing, you have to, there's a chemical reaction going on on the surface of the metal. So it, you have to make sure the metal's clean, and then however you polish it is how it's going to look. So if there's little scratches or, you know, there's little rust pits or something, well, the cold blowing's not going to cover any of that. As a yep. matter of fact, it's going to say, look, scratches are all <laughs> over this barrel, Yeah, <laughs> you know, when you're done. But let's say that you've got the metal finished where you, where you like it. What I like to do is make sure it's completely degreased. I use just rubbing alcohol, that's fine, or acetone or something like that would be good. And there's nothing wrong with wearing either cotton gloves or clean, uh, you know, latex type gloves while you're handling that metal. But here's one of the biggest secrets. There's just two or three big secrets. And the first big secret is heat the metal. And I don't mean heat it like in your oven heat it. I mean heat it with a, a blow dryer. 
Ah. And you want it, yeah, you want it warm enough that it's like, you know, that's pretty warm. It's not that it's so hot that you can't hold it, but that it's pretty good and warm. Yeah. And what I found over the years, and other people have too, is that for some reason, warming the metal makes it a little more receptive to this chemical reaction. Ah. Um, then the, uh, the next thing you do is you get yourself a clean, a couple of clean uh, cotton gun patches, and then you saturate them pretty well. And then you go ahead and you just wipe that on your, your you know, clean, shiny metal. And, and don't panic <laughs> because <laughs> it's going to be this smeary, disgusting-looking mess. And you're going to think, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know? Well, what you've done is just started is all. And so what you want to do is, is you know, dip that two or three times, get a nice good coat on it. And then the next thing you're going to do is get some four aught steel wool. So that's, you know, steel wool has different kinds of, of, of degrees of, of fine. So four aught is zero, 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 zero. So it's real fine. And you want to have a little piece of that and you soak it with bluing and then rub that over what you've just done oh. hard enough that you're going to kind of blend it, but not so hard that you're trying to rub the old bluing off. Yeah. And what you're going to start to see then is suddenly it's going to start to blend and it's going to even the color out. And then oh. you're going to start to gloat, but <laughs> it's not time to, yeah, it's not time to gloat yet. So, so at that point, I like to go ahead and wipe it off with a clean plot, cotton cloth and then go ahead and do that two or three or four times. Apply the bluing with a patch, rub it with a saturated four aught steel wool, and then after the last time, you're gonna, you know, it'll, it will get darker and darker until it reaches a point that it won't get any more dark. And then, you, so you can stop it any time in between. Oh, I like it about this color, or I want it to be even, you know, darker. Yeah. And then when you've reached the point that you've got a color that you think you look nice, that looks nice. Then go ahead and get a new, clean, fresh piece of uh, four-aught steel wool. Uh, soak it liberally with some kind of gun oil or WD-40. It doesn't really matter. And then go over what you've just done lightly. And I promise you, unless the base metal is some mystery metal that <laughs> you know you shouldn't be bothering with anyway, uh, your bluing job will look really good. And you'll amaze and astound your friends. Very cool. Well, I may have to try that because... Yeah. I've I've done I've dabbled with it in the black arts and it it I think I stopped where you said where the first coat you go oh no I've I've ruined yep. this thing and that's where it kind of <laughs> scared me off and I quit so apparently I just didn't go far enough. Well, that's that, and that is the thing. Now, now it is a bit of a challenge when you're getting in revolver flutes and nooks and crannies and corners, and you know that's why it's kind of hard. Uh, just like regular bluing, though, if you're going to reblue your your pistol, you've got to detail strip it. You know, it, yeah. it's really got to go get down to the last pin, unless you're just doing some touch-ups. Uh, and you can also, let's say you've got a, a barrel of your blued revolver, and it's it's pretty worn, you know, on the side or something. Well, you don't really want to re blew the whole gun or anything you can do that same technique that we just described and sort of blend the cold bluing in with the existing bluing yeah and and you'll see i mean it, when you're all done you'll look at it and you'll think oh that looks better than it did before you know what the heck yeah. <laughs> but that's that's the the magic of cold bluing is you clean it heat it apply it with a patch uh, copiously don't be stingy and then uh, dress it with a uh, four out steel wool, also you know with the bluing solution on it. And then when you're all done, wipe it all off, and then one more rub with four out steel wool with, with some oil on it, and you're good to go. Now I have to throw a caution out. There are a few brands of cold bluing solution that, and I don't know what the chemical reaction here is, but when you dip. A steel wool in it, it actually attacks the steel wool <laughs> and generates heat. Oh, it's, I mean, it'll like, yeah, it'll burn your fingers. Oh it's, my! And yeah, and I can't remember the ones, but but you could still do that. But just use like a, they make a bronze steel wool yeah. that works pretty well. Huh. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, so you do that. So so just be prepared. Most of the normal uh, cold bluing that you get over the counter, like what you get from Brownells and stuff like that, I've never had that problem. Uh, the stuff that I was using one time was a commercial solution that machine shops use uh-huh. for cold bluing, tooling, you know, yeah. and things like that. So, uh, but I almost caught myself on fire. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That one tip may be worth the price of admission right there. Don't set yourself mm-hmm. on fire. <laughs> now, we had talked earlier about cold blue pens, and that's where I've had most of my experience because, as, as I said in our previous podcast, I've boogered up lots and lots of screws before I bought a good hollow ground uh, set of screwdrivers, and I, I hate that. Um, and like you said, most guns, especially, old, I mean, older guns will show up with, with messed up screw heads and a, a light touch with a file to clean those up just makes things look so much better, but then you got to get them to match the, the bluing. So that's, I have used it for that, but I've, I've never been completely satisfied. And again, I think maybe I wasn't going far enough, uh, a couple of coats and, and a little polishing and all that. Well, and, and it's hard on a screw head, but it's it's really it's a mini version of the same process. Uh, you don't really have to heat it so mm-hmm. much, but you want to apply the bluing and then kind of rub it lightly with some steel wool and then apply some bluing and rub it lightly because the steel wool is helping it to blend the, the surface of the bluing solution. And then when you're done, uh, you put a little oil on it. Now, there's, you, could, you could do something else with screws, which is actually easy to do, and it's kind of fun. Uh, and that's called heat bluing. Uh-huh. And uh, people may not really know this, but if you had like a, 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 a drill rod that was polished shiny silver and you started to heat it at one end with like a propane torch, that you'll see a band of colors slowly move up, you know, the right. metal shaft as it, you've seen that. Yep. I think we've all seen that. And to where as they heat to different temperatures, they all turn different colors. So a straw color is a, a, a real light yellow color, and that means it's still relatively hard. Uh, Luger, certain Luger parts like safeties and triggers are that straw color. That's how they do that. Well, if you look a little further down the band, you'll see a real pretty kind of dark blue you know, I mean, there's a kind of a purple blue. There's a, a you know, a really darker, darker yeah. blue. And and it, what so what you do is you hold your screw that you polished, and so it's shiny silver. And then you just touch it, you know, in in the flame of a propane torch, and just watch it really carefully. And as soon as it gets that color that you like, boom, dip it in. Uh, it doesn't really matter, oil or water or whatever, and that stops the heat right at that color. Uh-huh. And so it's called heat bluing. And a lot of screws on, especially antique guns, were heat blued. Now, there. the only the only problem with it, yeah, the only problem with it is that it's not real durable, uh, but but for a screw on a side plate or yeah. something, it doesn't make any difference at all. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's well, worth experimenting. You don't have to experiment on your gun screw. Just, you know, use any old piece of metal you've got on your workbench. Yeah. Well, that, that makes complete sense. I may try that because the other thing I found is I don't use the blue pin very often and it seems like it's always dried out. So then I'm, <laughs> I've got to stop and go buy a new one and, you know, go through that process. So I've, I've always got a torch here. So now <laughs> I, I suppose it goes without saying, but uh, speaking of, of uh, cold blue pin follies, you got to make sure it's steel, too. I may have, I, I may know somebody that kind of made that mistake that an alloy frame gun <laughs> means exactly that. It's not necessarily steel. I've, I've cursed my way through a few guns thinking that it was. Now I just, you keep a magnet attached yeah. to your vice. And so just, you know, put a magnet. Now they do make a black, blackening uh, chemicals. Yep. Uh, Aluma black, I think it's called. Yep from outers or Birchwood Casey. I can't remember. Birchwood Casey, maybe. And uh, what it does is it, it, it acts like bluing, but it, it basically puts a black oxide on aluminum. Uh, just between you and me, I've, I've never really been impressed by it. It's, it's kind of dirty and it's hard to get it to stick. And I think it's best if you've just got a little wear maybe on an aluminum trigger guard or something yeah. like that. That's you that's kind of what I've used it for is to cover up little nicks because I've not found it to last very long. It rubs off pretty easy. Of course, the base metal is pretty soft, too. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing people forget about is uh, the good old Sharpie pens. And yeah. so 
I always keep one in my shooting box because that way, if you're shooting and you'll see a, you know, your sights might be a little bit shiny on the corners or something like that. Just hit them with a Sharpie pen and, and, you know, and you're back in business. Yep. Uh, now, a hundred years ago in the old days, we used to use candles or lighters or stuff like that. And you, we would soot our yep. sight, the front and the back sights. Remember that? And oh, yeah. shooting PPC shooting or something. It was great. Yeah. And then somebody like Outers or somebody thought they were going to revolutionize the world and they made like a spray <laughs> soot. Yeah. You know, of course, though, if you're around a bunch of cop, cops and somebody has a can of spray soot, you know, that's never a good thing because <laughs> that's going to get all over everybody and everything after that. So Exactly. Well, let's move on to something that I've I've played with ever since they came out, but the, the new proprietary spray on coatings and now they come in every color there's uh even water dip that is more professional rather than a uh, amateur type thing but i've known guys that have done that at home too so what has been your experience let's, let's start with probably the granddaddy which is like a cerakote type of thing basically people think you spray it on and you bake it and everything's good and it can be <laughs> but it takes a little more than that it, yeah, it really does, and it and it's and it's really not something the average you know schmo can do, because uh, you do need an oven and you do need certain equipment, and it's not exactly inexpensive to get set up for it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, if I think if somebody wanted to take it on, and now he was going to do it for his his group of friends or something, and they could share the cost, it's really just makes better sense and cheaper that if you just want to have a couple guns done is you just, you know, pay somebody who knows how to do it for real. Like we've talked about this before, you know, let the guys who are professionals do it. And yeah. then it's really simple and easy. Uh, that's like that Duralar is another finish that's similar. Uh, I like them. They actually have kind of a chrome finish and a nickel plated finish. It looks really good. It's really pretty shiny. Uh, yeah, they make a, a bluing kind of color that looks pretty good. Uh, most of the companies can do this. Something to keep in mind, though, for people is that those are spray on finishes. And yeah, they're baked on and they're harder. You know, they're like kind of like an epoxy base. Um, but th but the challenge for them is that especially on the corners of slides and, you know, and things like that, they do wear. Oh, yeah. And so... Yeah, and I think people forget that is that because they'll get their brand new, beautifully, you know, Cerakoted gun and they look handsome. And I love the fact you could have multiple colors on one gun if you want, you know, do the screws one way and the hammer and the trigger, to, you know, the, they look really handsome. And but just be prepared for the fact that if you carry the gun in a holster, if you go a field with it and stuff, it is going to wear and it will nick and it will, you know, uh, not be pristine forever, but it's, but I think it's really cool for what it does. A million years ago, Robar sort of started that whole movement with his Rogard. Yeah. Uh, spray on, bake on finish. And, uh, I mean, there's, there's another kind, which are the more metal plating, like, you know, nickel and MP3 and yes. armaloy and all those kind of things. But those are there's just nothing that anybody could do themselves. <laughs> I was going to uh, say, that's not something you can do at home unless you happen to have a, a you know, and all the necessary. Uh, yeah. Equipment. You know, it's, if NASA calls you for advice on how to finish metal, then you probably know what you're doing <laughs> yeah. there. So, uh, you know, which actually interesting. I know Robbie Barkman at Coding Technologies, uh, who who started Growbar. That's actually exactly what he does. Is yes. he he actually has metal coating technology that's aboard the space shuttle and things like that, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, there, now there is another thing though that the average guy can do, and that is that there are various spray on uh, some of them are still bake on uh, but they're not as high temperature bake on as some of the Cerakotes and stuff like that. Uh, Brownells yeah. sells them. I can't remember their brand name, but it's basically you can get, you know, brown and black and blue and green and red, you know, and all these different colors. And then you basically prep your gun. It's pretty simple to do. And then you spray it, you know, like hang them from little pieces of metal inside a big cardboard box so you don't get yelled at. And um, and then you, some of them, it'll just set up on its own. Some of them, you can put them in a low temperature oven to sort of kick it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I've done those and they actually look very presentable there. I think that they're good for, Hey, this is my old 870 duck gun. That's kind of rusty, yep. you know, and you want to make it nice again, or, 
you know, your your Marlin Model 6022 that you've forgotten left outside for a year <laughs> and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that kind of stuff. But but I think it's well worth a, a, a try, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, one tip, for, and this is truly from a friend. I didn't do this, but he uh, bought one of those proprietary coatings, and it was, you know, low temperature bake on, which is 400, because, you know, that's low temperature when you're talking metalworking. But he did it in the house, and him and his wife <laughs> had some discussion about that <laughs> odd smell that they couldn't quite get out of the kitchen for a couple of weeks. Oh, it could be really stinky. That's why people who do that, uh, you know, they buy a all cheap, you know, oven yeah. you know, from the junk guy yep. and put it out in the garage. And, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. I've been driven out of the house myself <laughs> doing one or two adventures like that. Uh, but I think all this kind of stuff that we're talking about is it's all good to do, even if it doesn't come out successful. So if you were going to do one of these spray on coatings is I would find one uh, at Duralore uh, and a couple companies actually have them. You could buy the kit and it's got like a cleaner and a, you know, it's got all the things you need to do it in a big blister pack. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then get your old beat up shotgun or, or, and just do it. Yeah. And that's how you get the experience, you know, and then, and then the next job that you do will be done a little better and then a little better. And then pretty soon you're doing a pretty good job. Uh, and that's certainly how I got with cold bluing. You know, my first cold bluing looked like, you know, a, it's something just bizarre. You know, you had to avert your eyes. Yeah. And, uh, but now I can pretty confidently re-blue things and, and it, it looks pretty good, you know, yeah. to where you hand them to people and, and they say, wow, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. Do you do bluing? You know, and I'd say, well, cold bluing. They, they don't recoil so. in horror. <laughs> They don't recoil in horror and run fleeing out the door with their hair on fire. Who, who refinished this gun? Beavers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Now, true. I've got a friend who, who swears and affirms that he does water dip. And it's really complicated, but he's done it at home. And I've seen some of the stuff he's done, and it looks okay. Have you ever messed around with that? I, you know, I have. And... Uh, I, I didn't really like it. I did it just to, so I could understand the process. Yeah. Cause I, in the industry, well, I don't know what, 10 or 12 years ago, it, it, it kind of had a little spike of popularity yeah. for a little while. And, uh, I, I didn't like it because of its unpredictable nature, because uh -huh. you can't, you can't make a gun all one color. Yeah. You know, at least I never could. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they can. I don't, I don't think they can. Uh, but it is great for doing like a camo looking pattern, yeah. you know, uh, cause basically you, this, you, you float the color on the surface of the liquid. And then when you lift the gun out, it sort of wraps itself around the gun. Yeah. And, uh, but there's a certain amount of sort of cleanup and trimming and, uh, you know, you get, yeah. got to get it all together. So, I mean, yeah, the average guy could do it, but I think I, I, to me, it's like for duck hunting, you know, guns and the, you know, for your compound bow so yeah. you can hide in the weeds and nobody will see you. Or you can go back to the original, which is rattle can. And every single one of us at some point <laughs> has probably done at least a stock in rattle can green and, and brown. Well, you know, you brought up, that's a very good point. And a lot of people may not even know that is that if you've got some, some old rifle stock that you want to sort of camouflage up, you just collect three or four different kinds of leaves from your yard. And then generally you do a base coat of some color on the gun, brown or green or gray or something. And then you just like lay a leaf on there and kind of dust around the edges and put another one someplace and dust around with two or three different colors. And but I've seen some really good jobs. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Uh, There's another finish out there that I actually had a, a Model 19 sent away is Parkerizing. And that one is another one of those. You leave that one to the professionals. I guess it's even... Uh, more dangerous and challenging than doing hot bluing. Well, you know, actually, I've parkerized. And really? It, 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 yeah, it, it's it's pretty safe. I mean, it, it actually really is pretty safe to do. I mean, you don't want to drink it or anything. Huh. Uh, it's it's phosphating. It's called. And so, in a nutshell, I mean, you can buy the solution from Brownells. It's a, like a quart. It's kind of a ice blue looking liquid. And in, in a nutshell, what you what you do is you heat up some water to about 180 degrees. Uh, it's a pre-mix 
I forget what it was, like 7% solution or something like that. And then, uh, and then while you prep the gun and the only, here's the only hitch though. And that's why it is not necessarily something the average guy can do is you really be, do need a bead blaster or a sand blaster because uh-huh. the surface of the metal has to be etched. Parkerizing won't take on a, on a smooth, shiny gun. Uh-huh, and okay. so, yeah. So what you do, uh, my friend Dusty, who who builds custom 1911s, I showed him how to parkerize it. He actually parkerizes uh, guns now pretty regularly, and because it's kind of it looks good. Uh, and for people who don't know what it is, just think of like an M1 Garand or a World War II 1911, you know, a, a military commercial AR-15 or something. That gray, dark, you know, matte finish, that's the parkerizing that we're talking about. And uh, But anyway, so you sandblast your gun, and then when your solution's ready, you you, you dip it in it, and you uh, you just hang it with on wires. So it just it is suspended in the solution. And then it starts to fizzy up. Remember the old fizzies you used to drop <laughs> yeah. two tablets in water? With fizz? Yeah, it does that. Huh. And, uh, yeah, and after about oh, eight or ten minutes or so, you'll see the fizzing stop. And what's happening is that it's, it's eating microscopic bits of metal from the surface of the metal. And then at a certain point, it then redeposits it back on the metal through the chemical reaction in there. So then when you pull it out, you've got this pretty handsome looking kind of gray or black, you know, finish, yeah. uh, which is, it's soft right then. So you, you, you clean it gently. And then once it's dry, then you oil it. And the reason why parkerizing is, is successful is because it's like, it's a teeny tiny microscopic layer of sponge that's all over your gun. So uh-huh. when you oil it, it holds the oil, you know, wow. uh, yeah, so there you go. More than we needed to know about parkerizing, but but you are right. I would put that in the category of you better read up on this before you do. <laughs> well, and that was going to be the point I made that obviously the person that explained it to me, they didn't know that much about it because you you punctured several long standing myths that I held uh, about parkerizing. So I guess that would be maybe a good point to to leave on, which is. Do your due diligence, listen to the buddies that tell you, but also make sure that they know what they're talking about because there's plenty of information out there and guns and American handgunner magazines are great sources for that and our our DIY and surplus publications. So there's plenty of uh, resources out there. Don't just take the guy down at the gun counter's word for it. (laughs) I think and and go do it, you know, I mean, just... You know, go to the local, you know, store or academy or one of those kind of places or order online and get you well, like a little gun bluing kit from Outers or Birchwood Casey. They make they make little blister packs and it's got, you know, old bluing remover and then it's got surface cleaner and then it has cold bluing, uh, all in the same little thing. And then, uh, you know, find that old rusty 22 or just get a good piece of metal and just do it. Yep. I see so many people say, if only, if only, if only. It's like, look it off your butt and go do it. <laughs> and then you, it'll be fun. Yep. So, Well, Roy, thanks for walking us through that. I've learned a, a bunch here today, and the subject was even deeper than I thought it was going to be. Kind of like a, a good, deep blue-black uh, finish on, you know, an old Smith & Wesson. Well, you know, that's, yeah, let's talk about that for just a second. And that is that the old pre-war guns, the old pre-war Colts and Smith and Wessons really were a different color blue. And because the chemicals were different and the process was different. And as, as the uh, years went by, it, the process had to be streamlined and had to be made more affordable. And so they, the gun companies changed chemicals. And that's where you get the more the black bluing that we have today. Mm-hmm. I mean, because they, they call it bluing, but it, and it was bluing. You, know, like it, you go online and go to gunbroker.com or something, look at some of these old Colt officers' target match guns. And boy, look at some 1920s era Colt 1911s, and they're just the prettiest blue yeah <laughs> you know and uh now doug turnbull kind of still can do that today he does niter bluing and he does uh the carbona bluing and rust bluing and that's some really pretty stuff so if you're interested i would recommend that people learn about that well 
we've we've all got our marching orders. Now it's time to hit the shop and, and actually try it out. So, well, Roy, thank you for filling us in on all that cool stuff, everything you wanted to know, and maybe some you didn't about DIY gun finishes. So thanks a lot. All right, buddy. Thanks for having me. It's always fun talking to Roy, and like always, I learned a bunch of stuff myself, so maybe my next refinish job won't look like the work was done by preschoolers. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even the gloating liberals. Guns Magazine is number one in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring in the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments, please drop me a line. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out by subscribing to us on your favorite podcatcher and on YouTube. Of course, you can always listen and download our episodes at gunsmagazine.com, and we'd all appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or two on your own social media channels. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine, at AmericanHandgunner.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. On behalf of our hardworking staff here at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.